think anybody ever listens to me. I'm in here. How would they treat you here? You're looking puny. Are you eating? I eat. What are we really talking about? The ground was juddering. I think I'm starting to feel something. I've had a holy vision. Hey everyone, so that right there was taken from a new short film called uh, Juddering, which was written and directed by James Lambs. He's an award-winning filmmaker and playwright and also a good friend of mine. And uh, I was fortunate to see a screening of this movie a couple months ago and it was a good time. And there was also a nice little Q&A session at the end of it with Jim. And today uh, I'm very honored. He's taken the time to just sit down with me and talk a little bit about his new film. And I'm really excited to share this with you. Uh, but before I get into the interview, uh, just a little bit about the plot of the movie. It involves this uh, troubled teenager named uh, Otto, who is played by Oscar Williams. And this kid is suffering from schizophrenia. He hears voices in his head. He's experiencing climate anxiety. He tries to communicate his fears to his pretty dismissive grandpa, played by Dennis McSorley. And it just goes from there. So without further ado, let's start this interview, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I had doing it. Just wanted to mention that, like, a few years ago, you went through a pretty life-threatening battle with cancer. Yes, yes. Shortly afterwards, you wrote that script for The Judge Ring and started pitching the idea and um, getting it into production, and... I guess I wanted to ask, like, after being through, like, such a traumatic experience like that, and then not too long afterwards, like, jumping right back into, like, the director's seat mm -hmm. and, and working on a film again, like, what, what did that feel like? Well, actually, it was, it was, it, it, the reason I did it was I felt a certain urgency. Um, you know, there's nothing, uh, nothing, there's no better wake-up call than a, than a diagnosis of cancer and, then after the diagnosis, it was radiation and I had four different surgeries. Um, it was it was really quite traumatic, and so when I got through all of that process, um, I just wanted to keep working in a really really big kind of way. And so uh, you know, the first thing I wanted to do is to just to jump on a short film as quickly as possible, mm. maybe even too quickly. It might have been better to take a little bit of a breather, but uh, because even still on the set, you know, I was still uh, dealing with some of the. Uh, the issues with surgery and, and things like that. But, uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was great to jump right in. Um, it, it felt good to jump right in. Um, and uh, it was it was just a little clunky on set. You know, I had to uh, <laughs> walk around with a, uh, uh, a cane. I tripped and fell once, but it was good, and it was very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. uh, art is also always, I think, uh, kind of a healer, um, so a healing force. So. Uh, we uh, shot in Waterbury Center, and we shot in uh, yeah. uh, Winooski, and shot up in uh, uh, northern Vermont. So, uh, yeah, we uh, it was, and it was two different seasons. We shot in the summer, and we also shot in the dead of winter. Yeah, yeah and we shot it all on the iPhone, and uh, the iPhone allowed us to, to squeeze into a really, really tight spot. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was really, uh, really important. And so, th th those were uh, some of those evocative shots in the film. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Steven Soderbergh actually inspired me to do that um, because he shot several films with an iPhone. And, um, and I, I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate that from an ex experimental uh, standpoint also, um, that we have this incredible tool uh, that all of us are carrying right now. And so it really democratizes uh, filmmaking. Like the theme of it, the climate yes. anxiety, and uh, uh, through the lens of this kid struggling with mental illness, right. they can't like verbalize or communicate it directly. And he can just feel this kind of sense of unease and tension. Mm -hmm. um, like what drew you to like tell that story? Well, initially how I started the film is... Um, I don't know if you remember, but I, I think it was probably back in 2017 uh, or uh, around that time, um, a climate activist by the name of Greta Thunberg um, yeah. was publicly shamed and dissed by our former president. And I, just, I remember that. That was just so infuriating to me um, that here's this young person, this teenager, who's working really hard 
from one of the really big issues of our time, if not the biggest issue of our time. And here the American president is, is publicly dissing her. And I guess that would have been the actual spark of it. Citing CO2 and toxic air as a cause of rising temperatures globally, Thunberg left with a warning for those in power. Young people are starting to understand your betrayal. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. Initially, I, I didn't want to identify the issue directly as climate anxiety. I wanted it because so many teens these days are just feeling anxiety, period. And I didn't want to uh, be specific to it. Um, I wanted to, to show that, uh, you know, as in, you know, one of the first shots of the film is, you know, a school for troubled teens. And, um, you know, troubled is, is definitely how I would, would, would term it. I, my kids uh, certainly feel it. Uh, other kids that I know feel it. And, um, and I wanted to, to convey that. But in some of the initial screenings, I noticed that uh, people people wanted more clarification. The audience wanted more clarification as to what the juddering <laughs> feeling really was connected to. And I felt I had to do a little bit more to clarify the specific issue. And, and it helped. It helped to clarify it. Um, I, I tend to be... Um, a little bit more vague, uh, and I think it, in this case that probably was not uh, was not the best choice. So, clarified it, and um, had always been the issue of climate anxiety and climate uh, uh, change, but uh, um, I, I tried to clarify it more uh, as we went into post production and later uh, shoots. Because when I first first read the script, I I read it as kind of like a, a story. Uh, you know, a coming of age story of this kid dealing with mental illness. Yes. And also how the, the lack of empathy towards the mentally ill. Yeah. And regarding that piece, because, you know, we've seen other recent pictures like the Joker and so forth tell their own stories of mental illness and here is yours. You know, what made you want to bring that into the film and portray it in that way? Well, it's, it's an issue that I've always um, been interested in. Um, I have a very close family member who uh, is, is who has dealt with a lifetime of uh, mental illness, uh, specifically a schizoaffective disorder, mm. and um, I certainly felt my share of <laughs> mental anguish and mm. mental illness over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, young people, uh, teens, and um, folks in their early twenties dealing with the onset of mental illness. I have such a profound uh, empathy and respect for that population. I feel like that they carry a really heavy weight for the rest of us. So, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, profoundly respectful of them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, and I, you know, to be honest with you, I, uh, I, I, I think they make, or I think, I think folks dealing with mental illness also make really good characters. Um, I think, uh, mm -hmm. I think, I think, you know, if you're a well-adjusted, happy person, that's not a very interesting film character. Um, but, you know, give the person something that they have to deal with, which we've all dealt with. Um, and I think they become really interesting very quickly. Come on, Otto, it's 13 degrees out. I mean, <laughs> What are you doing? I can't feel with my shoes on. Feel what? Anything. I can't feel anything. That's the whole purpose of shoes. So you don't feel shit on your bare feet. Now get your shoes on. Let's leave. No. Oscar did such a really good job, and I'm really proud of him. He really um, stepped up and, and did a lot with a really challenging role. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of him. You're drawn towards damaged characters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and... Uh, I wanted to mention this article you recently came out with, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. titled yeah. Um, yeah. Coming Out as a Gay Man After 30 Years of Marriage, yeah. which yeah. you can go to your website. There's a link to it and read it. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned it because in that article you mentioned, like, uh, a lot of your work features these damaged characters, characters right. who have experienced, like, a great hurt. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just wanted to ask, like, 
uh, for one, uh, what inspired you to to put this coming out story out now? And also, like, and do you think it's going to have an impact on on your future work or how it's perceived by the audience? I don't know how it's going to be perceived um, in, in, with respect to how people view it or how they would view it in, in uh, my work. The reason, the, the, quite honestly, other than the fact of being extremely tardy, um, the, <laughs> the reason to do it now um, is that I, I constantly had young characters um, dealing with heavy duty issues, uh, that, uh, that presented themselves in my work. And I thought I would be being far, far less than genuine and honest if I did not, uh, come out on my own and, and be honest and respectful, um, to that part of myself. And it's been a long time in coming and it's something that Lynn and I have, have shared for a couple of decades and uh it was time it was far far you know uh, too long uh, uh mm. that it took but uh now that it's out there i'm proud to, uh, to have had it out there and the response has been generally favorable now i feel like i can move forward in my own uh writing and my next uh film and my next mm. short story my next play whatever it is and I can have a young gay character in that story and, and, and speak to that character honestly. And, um, you know, and so I would say that my, <laughs> more than anything else, my, uh, my, uh, my art, my film, my writing compelled me to do that. Um, it would have been, it probably would have been much easier to have not done it. And, uh, I uh, just just kind of stayed with the status quo, but I don't think I don't think uh, and I don't think moving forward with any new work that I could present it honestly and genuinely without also being honest and genuine about myself. I think I think ultimately that's that's why I did that. And okay, last question is <laughs> so. A juddering, like how can people go see this film or watch it? Is it going to be streaming anywhere? Well, not now, unfortunately. Um, for a film um, to uh, for a film that wants to enter uh, or that is in the process of entering the film festival circuit, mm. um, a lot of film festivals have. In fact, most film festivals have a requirement that the film has never been streamed online anywhere, and that it can't be available online and you can mm. understand that a yeah. film festival wants to present a film as in like this is the only place that you can see his film is at a film festival yeah. because if people can watch them on their computer at home there's yeah. no reason to come to a film festival yeah and so i'm going to be doing our film festival run uh through uh, april um mm. hopefully we'll get into a couple more festivals i think we've gotten into mm. seven so far oh wow that's um, great. and that's good yeah, oh, yeah yeah i'm really proud of that the, the, and it's not just not just uh oscar and dennis and and, and uh the rest of the cast and and uh, the rest of the crew and it's it's so many people worked uh to bring this thing to fruition uh, including our sponsors and our supporters uh, and I'm just really, really grateful to everybody. This is a real uh, collaborative effort. And so, yeah, I'd love for many, many people to be able to watch it. But at least until April, um, the only way to watch it would be to like shoot me an email. And I'm glad to, to send you the, uh, the password for, uh, yeah. for a single viewing. Nice. Uh, and then until after April. And then after April, I have to renegotiate our song rights. Uh, with the rights holders of we we have three songs including Bob Dylan's uh, the times they are changing which was re-recorded by a uh, Minnesota children's choir yeah um, so we have to renegotiate all of that uh, okay. if we want to be able to put it online and okay. I, hope, I hope we'll be able to do that and I want to thank Jim again for taking the time to discuss his new film and give a little insight as well about how he puts together a movie I mean it's pretty inspiring to see an indie filmmaker like Jim 
put himself out there with such honesty and such commitment to his craft, I mean, that's a beautiful thing, man. And I do hope that Judge Ring gets more recognition and hopefully we'll see a wider distribution of it at some point. I mean, that would be pretty awesome. And I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye out for what Jim does next. I think he's a very talented filmmaker. And if you would like to know more about Jim and his work, uh, I've provided the links to his websites in the description below. So yeah, go check those out. And I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time here. <laughs> Granddad. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap, folks. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right. Mala, uh, Rufus, that's a wrap. <laughs>